Good morning. Happy New Year's Eve. Yeah, yeah. Happy New Year's Eve. You know, when we talk about uh, Christmas, which we just obviously came out of, uh, it's, it's very common for people to say it's the most wonderful time of the year, right? It's the most wonderful time of the year, uh, which is strange given the amount of stress and financial debt people put themselves under, uh, but it's what we say. It's what the song says. But when we get to New Year's, I think more accurate than saying it's the most wonderful time of the year would be to say it's the most optimistic time of the year. It's a very optimistic time, isn't it? It's the time of the year when you believe, you actually believe, you're going to do all the things that you said you'd do. Like somehow, never mind the fact that you decided to start eating healthier and going to the gym and spending less money multiple times this year. This time you mean it. Right? When January 1 rolls around, things are going to change. It's the most optimistic time when we think that, like, somehow, because it's a new year, things are going to be different than they've been this whole time. Forbes gave an updated list of resolutions for 2024. I, or I imagine many of you will be very not surprised by the resolutions put down. They're more or less the same every year. Uh, number one, beating everything else by over a 10% margin. 48% polled said improved fitness. That's always the one. Uh, additionally, I read that 11% of all gym annual memberships are purchased in the first week of January. That's more than any other month in the entire year, that one week. Uh, moreover, 49% said that they would use an app for their health goals. Apps including uh, calorie counting, workout design, habit tracking, sleep tracking, meditation. Apart from resolutions built around improved physical health, 38% uh, coming in second place said they were going to aim for improved finances. And then, of course, rounding out the top three at 36%, better mental health. Uh, the, the week between Christmas and New Year's Day is truly the most optimistic time of the year. And when you think about it, the promise of the new year is almost, not quite, but it's almost a picture of the message of grace. Think about this for, for a moment. The idea of a new you that makes different and better choices than the old you. The, the idea of a day when, when everything just starts over and all of your mistakes go away, you get a new and fresh start where everything you did no longer counts against you. I mean, that, that is the promise of, of New Year's Eve, right? That when the clock strikes midnight, New Year rolls in, all of a sudden things are going to be different and better than they've ever been. You don't have to keep reminding yourselves or dwelling on the mistakes you've made this year because this year is over with. It's a new year, new year, new you, right? That's what we like to say. It mimics the message of grace and the gospel. These are gospel promises. When, when you really think about it, they're gospel promises. The gospel promises that you will be a new you, a new creation. It's the biblical language, Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The gospel announces that all of your mistakes are done away with, paid for by the blood of Jesus, forgiven, cast into the sea of the abyss, right? The, the, the promises that the New Year's makes mimics the gospel. But here's the catch. Where grace and the gospel succeed, New Year's Eve inevitably fails. Because, of course, all of these promises of a new year and a new you hinge on you actually doing what you said you would do perfectly. And we know that's not going to happen. Not perfectly. Jesus, grace, the gospel will never fail you. You will always fail yourself. You will not always make this next year the right food choices. You will not wake up every day that you decided to when it's cold outside and you're tired and work out even though you don't feel like it. You are not going to avoid buying frivolous, unnecessary things and thus save your money. It's just not going to happen. The message of New Year's Eve is a mirage. It's the world's cheap version of the gospel. It's like being in a desert, dying of dehydration, and seeing a beautiful oasis before you and running with everything you have to get there only to discover it was a figment of your imagination. It was never real. Two things will be true for you for certain when the clock strikes midnight. When it moves from 11.59 p.m. to 12 a.m. January 1, two things will be for certain. You will be approximately one minute older 
And number two, you will mistakenly write 2023 on every form you fill out for the next several weeks, <laughs> like you always do. Here's what I want to do this morning, other than raining on your parade, apparently. I want to offer, rather than giving you new resolutions for you to consider for the new year, I want to offer you a set of much more boring, old resolutions. Because you don't need new resolutions. You really don't. And statistically speaking, most resolutions, 90% of them, die by mid-February anyways. You don't need new resolutions. You need old resolutions. You need ancient resolutions. Resolutions that are tried and true, that have been proven through the test of time. And we find those in the Old Testament this morning in Psalm 143. If you have your Bibles, open them to Psalm 143. There are three directives that we find in our text this morning that will provide excellent resolutions moving into the new year. And if you will take these seriously, I don't say this often, but if you will take these seriously, really practice them every day, multiple times a day, you will have guaranteed a better year in 2024. I have no doubt about that. Promise. And it's not my promise, it's the promise of Scripture. Because anytime we walk in obedience to the Scripture, the Scripture never returns void in our lives. You can take this to the bank. God's Word never fails. Read the first four verses with me this morning. This is verses 1 through 4. It says, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. For the enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. Therefore, my spirit faints within me. My heart within me is appalled. Here's the first resolution that I want you to consider this morning. It's an old one. Resolve to look up more and request. Look up more and request. Verses 1 through 4 are in many ways a set of requests from King David. King David wrote this particular psalm, by the way. As a side note, David did not write all of the psalms. That may be kind of a misnomer that some people think. Uh, Solomon wrote some of them, Ethan the Ezrahite, the sons of Korah. There are several contributors to the, the body of the psalms. David wrote the majority of them. And he did write, in particular, Psalm 143, our text this morning. And in, in verses 1 through 4, he's pleading with God to hear his prayer and answer him. Verse 1, he says, Hear my prayer, O Yahweh. Calls him by his covenant name. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. He goes on to say, answer me, O God. There's a sense of, of pleading here. One, one great way to ensure that your year will fall more in line with the will of God is to bring yourself in line with the will of God through the action of prayer. Now, there is more to say about prayer than what we have time for in one sitting here this morning. But I do want to pay attention to a few details in this passage that help shape the way I think we ought to pray as God's people. There's some cues that we can take from David here that inform the posture of prayer that the people of God, I think, are intended to embody as we go about our day-to-day -day lives. So I want to walk through them briefly. As you make your request to God through prayer, do so, A, with confidence. Now, immediately, I'm going to pause here and qualify what we mean by confidence in prayer. I do not mean self-confidence, okay? I want to be very clear about that. Uh, there is a tendency within Christendom, within evangelicalism, to emphasize a kind of self-confidence in our prayer life. This is, by the way, the pathway that ultimately leads you to the name-it-and-claim-it mentality. It begins with a kind of self-confidence, a bravado when you're praying that ultimately develops into sort of demanding God to do things because of the kind of faith that I quote-unquote possess. That is not the posture of prayer that the Bible ever calls us to. When I say we are to make requests with confidence, I don't mean self-confidence. I mean confidence in who God is. The psalmist here in verse 1, I think it's interesting, uses this word plea. It's a word that's used repeatedly actually throughout the psalms. And it shares the same verbal root in Hebrew. There's another really important word in the Psalms and in other places of the Old Testament that's translated showing favor. Uh, this is a very important word, actually, to Old Testament theology proper. When we look at who God is in the Old Testament, this is a word that in some ways paints a picture of who he is because it's one of the attributes that God applies to himself. If you remember, for example, when God speaks to Moses in Exodus 34, 6, which, by the way, uh, next week, January 7th, we begin a new study in the book of Exodus. 
in our life Bible studies. And if you are uh, on the fence about whether or not you should join a Bible study, next week is a great time to jump in. Uh, it's an introductory, uh, introductory week to the study at large, and it's a great place to just kind of start from uh, the ground level and, and work through that. Exodus has a ton of amazing stories and moments in it, the, the Ten Commandments and the Passover. And I mean, there's, there's so many amazing parts of this book. In Exodus 34, 6, God appears to Moses and says this. He says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That term, gracious, it's the same root verbally as the word plea in verse 1. In other words, David is pleading with God or appealing to God on the basis of God's character. God is a gracious God. He's revealed himself as a gracious God. This is what he says here and in other places. And so when I make request of him, I'm appealing to his gracious nature. It means practically that you can have confidence when you pray because God has already revealed to us he's the kind of God that listens. You can take him at his word. I can pray with a confidence that God is going to hear my prayers, not because I'm, I'm worth listening to, but because God is faithful to do what he said he would do. He's faithful to act according to his character. He will never act in contradiction to his character. He said he's gracious and that he will hear the prayers of his people. I'm going to take him at his word and do that and appeal to that. And all throughout scripture, this is reaffirmed. Jeremiah 33, 3. God says, call to me, and I will answer you. In the New Testament, 1 Peter 3, 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and then check this out, his ears are open to their prayer. Perhaps the most clear verse for our purposes this morning, 1 John 5, 14, which we covered earlier this year in our study through 1 John, it says, and this is the confidence, there's that word, that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We can have confidence as we pray to God that when we pray to him as God's people, he will, according to his character, listen. Now, he might not do what you ask him to do. He's going to operate according to his will, not my will, but he will listen. And this, by the way, this promise has nothing to do with the quality of faith that I possess as I pray. There are times, if I could just be transparent with you, there are times in my life when I pray and it just is so easy. It almost comes like too easy, full of faith, full. It's just like, it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing experience. There are an equal number of times when I pray with almost a faithlessness. Like I, I'm praying because I know it's what I'm supposed to do because the word says it, despite the fact I think it's going to make very little difference in my life. Just being honest, Pastor Derek gets there too. If there are circumstances I'm facing, hardship, a difficult season, whatever's going on, bad pizza the night before, I, there are times when I pray and I don't mean it. I'm like, man, I'm doing this because I know this is what I'm supposed to do and I am dry as a bone inside. But listen to me, it doesn't matter because his faithfulness is not dependent on my faithfulness. And that is good news. It's based on his character on who he is. God is a gracious God. He listens when I request because of who he is, not because of who I am. I can be confident in that. I make my request with confidence. Secondly, you make your request with confession. This is almost equally important. Notice what David says in verse two. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. David is asking God to not judge him not on the basis that he's innocent, not on the basis that he doesn't deserve judgment, but on the basis that everyone deserves judgment. That's what he says. The doctrine of sin, we call this in theological circles, hemardiology, is a doctrine that is, in my mind, like so clear and simple in scripture, and yet people still take issue with it from time to time. And I, on for the life of me, cannot figure out why, except for just maybe pride. Uh, this one verse, I think, is enough to encapsulate what the doctrine of sin is in Scripture. He says, no one living is righteous before you. No one. No one. Of course, this is not the only place we find this kind of sentiment. Ecclesiastes 7.20. Surely... 
There is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. You can almost imagine God peeking over the clouds. Mm. Mm -hmm. Look at what verse verse 3 says. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Not even one person, save for Jesus, who will eventually come and live a righteous life. No one else. 1 John 1, 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Romans 3.23 actually follows Paul quoting that Psalm 14, 2, and 3 that I just read. He goes on in verse 23. He says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I mean, the Bible is clear about this. You are not innocent. I am not innocent. We are all guilty. We have all sinned before God. This is the whole point of the gospel. You need what you cannot obtain on your own. You need Jesus to obtain it for you. Forgiveness, restoration, peace, life, no judgment. This acknowledgement, I think, should be present in the majority of our prayers. God, I am unworthy, I have sinned, and yet you have graciously saved me. This confession, this acknowledgement of God's mercy in my life, despite the fact that I did not earn it, I think is crucial in in sort of molding my heart to a point that is more in line with God's will. So get this, uh, understand the connection here. The confidence with which you pray proceeds from God's character. The confession with which you pray comes from a lack of my own character. When I say God is able That's confidence. When I say, I am not able, that's confession. They're tied together. You pray with confidence. You pray with confession. Third, you pray with concern. Uh, Verses three and four have everything to do with David's concern for his own well-being. Verse three, he says, the enemy has pursued my soul. He's crushed my life to the ground. He's made me sit in darkness like those long dead. There's great concern in this prayer for the current state of things in David's life. Things are not well, God. It's getting bad down here. I think there's nothing wrong with, as you pray before the Lord, stating your own concerns for your own well-being as well. Now, again, it might mean that God's will for you is to be exactly where you are and that there's some sharpening that needs to happen in your life through those circumstances. Sometimes God does that. The goal of the Christian life is not happiness, it's holiness. So sometimes we end up in places where we would rather not be and God's like, no, you're supposed to be there. You'll figure out why. (laughs) That's Paul's point, by the way, in Philippians 4, 6. What does he say there? Do not be anxious about anything but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You make your requests to God, you let him know all the things you're concerned about, and then you let it go and let him handle the details. Trust that he's going to do what he's going to do. You see, next year will fundamentally be different for you if you spend more time looking up and requesting with confidence in who God is, he's a God who listens, with confession that you are broken and in need of him, and with a concern for your own well-being that leaves the results to him. If you don't think this will alter your life dramatically in 2024, you are mistaken. It absolutely will. You look up more and request. Secondly, you look back more and reflect. Keep reading verse 5. David says, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. David is interested in not only looking up more in prayer, but looking back more in appreciation for what God has already done. This is a big practice I think we neglect, frankly, in evangelicalism. We say things like, don't dwell on the past. You know, don't live in the past. Let, you know, what's done is done. And I think that sentiment is fine if it pertains to your sin that you've repented of and confessed and Christ has forgiven you and you've moved on. Absolutely. In that sense, you should not live in the past. If Christ has forgiven you, you've confessed, you've repented, move on. Don't live there. 100% agree with that. But the idea of never looking back, ever, 
This is not a biblical idea at all. There are so many things that God has done in the past that are worth looking back at and remembering and reflecting on. All throughout the Old Testament, you see the people of God constructing these monuments, and, and they're topped with what the, the Bible calls an Ebenezer stone. You remember in, uh, what is it, Come Thou Fount, Here I Raise My Ebenezer. It's always a, a weird lyric to people who don't know what this is, but it's a stone of remembrance. It goes on the top of an altar or a monument that's built to commemorate the work of God in these pivotal moments, these significant moments in history. They were built so that as you're wandering about your life and you come across one of these Ebenezer monuments, you remember, key word, God did something incredible here. And you reflect on that and are full of gratitude and, and celebrate that moment. Oh, I forgot about that. God was so gracious to his people here. Incredible. Was this Jericho? Isn't this where the walls were? Man, it's good to remember that. David says here, I meditate on all you have done. And I've mentioned this before in other contexts. It bears repeating. This word meditate in Hebrew is such an awesome word to think about. It's, it's a word that in the Hebrew language means literally to murmur or to mutter under one's breath. So think about like if someone says something to you and you kind of sarcastically <laughs> fall under your breath, which you would never do because you're a Christian. But it's that idea, right, of, of muttering something or murmuring something under your breath. So, so get this, biblical meditation is not sitting with your legs crossed and humming and thinking of nothing. That's not, that's not what the Bible means when it says meditate. Meditating in the Bible is repeating something over and over and over and over and over and over again. To meditate then, for example, on like a favorite Bible verse. Let's say you have a favorite Bible verse that God gives you that you're just like really touched by. You want to meditate on it. What that would entail is memorizing that or having it in front of you so you could read it and saying it over and over and over again as you go about your day. You're at a red light, you're in line at a store, you're at the grocery store, you're wherever, you are repeating that verse over and over again, sort of under your breath. I mean, you could do it loud, but then I don't know if it's really meditating at that point. Um, but under the breath, meditating. Uh, the classic example of this is in Joshua 1.8. This is like a, 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 the, the classic example of, of how meditation looks, right? So it says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you might be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Why will the book of the law not depart from your mouth? Because to meditate on it is to literally say it over and over again. It's literally in your mouth. And as you are saying it, because it's in your mind and in your mouth, you are now more likely to actually follow it, to actually do it, and not do your own thing. Because it's there, ruminating in your mind and in your brain. Here in Psalm 143, verse 5, David isn't meditating on the Word of God. He's meditating on the works of God. He's remembering all that God has done. He's recalling it to himself. He's, he's kind of telling himself these stories over and over again that have happened to him where God showed up and acted. Why? Because it's worth thinking about. It's worth remembering and celebrating. It's a good practice. So here's what I thought would be fun for us this morning. It's rare that we get to spend the last day of the year in church together, gathered together. And so I thought it would be cool for us to reflect on all that God has done here at City on a Hill over this past year. There's a lot of things. This has been a tremendously busy year. We saw a lot of things happen that I think are worth remembering and celebrating. Let me give you a quick snapshot of 2023. We had a record number of baptisms this year in the church's lifespan. 49 people baptized in 2023, 15 in 2022 by way of comparison. It was, it was a, mark, a marked difference. Um, that is worth remembering and celebrating. Uh, in January, we began a verse-by-verse -verse study through 1 John called Under Construction. It's hard to believe that was this year. It was earlier this year. We did this sermon series, Under Construction, uh, as a sort of fun sermon series that went along with the construction that happened on this stage that made it what it looks like now today and preparation for redesigning this space. And of course, we ultimately celebrated the new sanctuary, unveiled it, if you will, on Resurrection Sunday. We celebrated life over death in this new place. We baptized some of those 49 that morning in a new baptistry. It was just a fun 
great morning worthy of celebrating what God was doing here in this time of renewal. While that was happening, we had a new sound system being put in the gym uh, that had just been installed. Uh, the gym is a primary meeting place for our student ministry. We say we care about them. We say we care about the young people of our church. And then when you would walk over there, the gym was sort of like falling apart and the sound system didn't work. And it's, it's very hard to communicate value when where they're actually meeting communicates no value at all. So we renovated that space and put a new sound system in. And I will say that decision came uh, very much in handy for us as a church body at large, because if you remember, while this was under construction, the roof blew off and flooded this room and we had to meet in the gym for two weeks. And, and we were able to do that because of the changes that were made in there very, very easily. Short after, shortly after the worship center was completed in here, <coughs> we opened up and remodeled the foyer space because of the growth that God was bringing to us. We needed more space. It was becoming very congested in there. And, uh, and so we did all that. We also paved the new parking lot area out here as well that was formerly a uh, gravel death trap of sorts. Um, <laughs> Maybe a little strong, but I mean, it was a pretty substantially not safe space. It's, it's very ironic to me to say we're a safe place with a safe process and we have a very dangerous not safe parking lot. Um, so we changed that and paved that over. Over the summer, we launched our formational and informational podcast that you voted, not us, to call What the Hill is Happening. Um, <laughs> It is a podcast that highlights the upcoming major events of the month. It drops on the first or the second of each month, which means, incidentally, tomorrow, January 1st, the January episode will uh, be released. It's on YouTube. You can watch it or listen on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the major platforms for that. We also, in August, at our year lead conference, unveiled another podcast that is not only new, but also, at the same time, very old, that we titled The Landmark podcast based on Proverbs 22, 28. Do not forsake the ancient landmarks of your fathers. And in this podcast, we highlighted sermons from our founding pastor, Dr. James Reeves, and others who paved the way for us in this church going all the way back into the early 80s. Um, very different and younger sounding James Reeves at that time. Uh, those are also available on all major podcast platforms. At that year lead, we also unveiled the new logo, for City on a Hill that highlights the front of the building with the cross, something very important to us, uh, as well as the uh, third service that began in early October. We went from a 9 and 10.30 to an 8, 9.30 and 11 model here. We have added, or the Lord has added, we like to say, um, nearly 150 in weekly attendance since October, since we did that. Uh, the first weekend of October also began our monthly observation of communion, the Lord's Supper. We do that once a month now in service. Uh, we do all the normal things, but we've included that at the first Sunday of each month, which means, again, incidentally, next week, first Sunday of the year, we'll do communion for the first time in 2024. And then on the, the icing on the cake, I think, is, is that uh, typically, and I think this is true in most churches, the highest attended service for us is, is usually Resurrection Sunday. It's the Super Bowl of Christianity, right? Resurrection. Um, without resurrection, we're without hope. That's what Paul says. And, and so we always anticipate that's going to be the biggest service of the year. It was not for us this year. Uh, the biggest service came last Sunday uh, on Christmas Eve with almost 750 people here, which was just insane. Uh, yeah, a really an amazing day. The Lord has been at work here. If you haven't figured that out. And, and, and we, we say this over and over again. I say this over and over again, not only to the staff, but to myself and to everyone else. I'm just trying to stay out of the way, right? Uh, we we want to be prepared. We want to have plans, you know, but, but man makes plans. The Lord establishes his steps. And, and so we want to have plans, but we also want to be moldable and movable and, and, and know that, that God is at work and, and we trust him. We trust his will. There are already things that we believe are going to be pretty potentially huge for this church in the, the beginning of next year, and we'll address those when the time is right. But, but in the meantime, I think it is so important that we as God's people here remember this stuff. Life is so busy, and, and, and the church is busy. There's a lot of ministry happening here, and it's so easy to just, like, move to the next thing and never look back and reflect on, man, what has God done this year? 
insane. It's crazy. And here's what's crazy is it, it builds my confidence in him as well because now I'm not only confident in who he is because that's how he's revealed himself, but, but I am confident in who he is because of how he's revealed himself in his working in my own life. There's like real experience now with him. The scripture is enough. I mean, I, I trust that when God says it, he means it. But, but when he also backs it up with action in my own life, that I can look at and go, I was there. Yeah, that's, that's a confidence builder, isn't it? And who he is. In 2024, I challenge you, look up more and request. Look back more and reflect. And finally, look forward more and receive. Look at verse 10. He says, teach me to do your will for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. There's, there's an idea here in verse 10 of, of not only receiving the instruction of God, he says, teach me to do your will, but also receiving the spirit of God. Let your good spirit lead me. This is no doubt a reference to the Holy Spirit. In other words, once you've, I want you to catch the, 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 the progression here. Once you've looked up and made your request to him, you've looked back and you've reflected on all the things he's already done as he's been faithful to you, now you're ready to look forward and receive whatever he has to give you. If you begin this whole thing by just looking forward and receiving whatever he has to give you, you're going to be pretty perturbed at the things he puts in your hands. You're going to be like, this isn't what I asked for or what I was expecting but when you've made your request known and you've let the results go and you've looked back and seen how faithful God has already been to you, you get to this point, it doesn't matter what he puts in my hands because here's what I know for sure. Six months from now, I'm going to look back at this moment and I'm going to go, man, God was so faithful there. That isn't even what I asked for. That isn't even what I wanted. And how faithful was he to do that for me? This will fundamentally change your life if you do this don't need new resolutions, you probably won't hold them for long anyways. The motto should not be new year, new you. The motto should be new year, same God. People change, the years change, God remains the same. Faithful, gracious, good calls us to do the same things next year in 2024 that he's been calling his people to do for centuries, for thousands of years at this point. These are old resolutions and they are worth every bit of our time and effort. In 2024, let's look up more and request with confidence in who he is, with confession of who we are and concern for our well-being Let's look back more and remember all the times God already showed up and then look forward and receive whatever he intends by his will to give us and do it all with gratitude. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a gracious God who hears your people, a God in whom we have confidence, a God who loves and cares and leads his people. We confess that we are sinners in need of you and that you have provided for us everything we could ask for and more in your son, Jesus. We thank you for this year that you've given us. We thank you for the many times that you have orchestrated things that only you are capable of. Help us stay out of the way and be intent on your will and not our own and making much of you and not ourselves, of knowing more of your scripture, nothing else. How we love you and we honor you and we pray that, that you would continue to lead us in the way you always have. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.